Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, it's such a lovely day. Now, before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Saber Tooth Nations. And then to introduce myself, if you don't know, I'm Ruth Sharp, I'm Public Programs Manager here at OceanWise. And, and welcome to yeah, OceanWise. Our mission here at OceanWise is to inspire both the local and global communities to become OceanWise. And one of our um, campaigns that we're um, working on right now is our plastic pledge. And so the content team have made this fantastic video, which I shall play for you now, hopefully. that we're doing here at OceanWise, looking into uh, plastic pollution and how it's affecting our marine environment. But before we get going on the lecture, a few little housekeeping things to go through. Uh, just in case you're unaware, the um, location of um, the community events programs has changed. It's now on education.ocean.org forward slash ocean matters. So you can go to this thing, uh, view all the upcoming events and register, as well as you can sub subscribe for updates. So then I can send you emails when uh, new events are announced and registration for um, programs opens up. Uh, and so some upcoming um, events that you might be interested in. Uh, next Tuesday, uh, the 1st of May, uh, we have an exciting event, um, Paddling for a Cleaner Ocean. So, uh, Matilda Gordon and Lucy Graham are from Australia, and they are here um, taking a three-month paddle from Alaska to uh, Vancouver Island. And on the way, they're raising funds and awareness about plastic pollution, as well as, as, well as seeing how communities are um, fighting plastic pollution and how it affects them. They've be, both been living single-use plastic free since 2016 and this three-month paddle of theirs they will be doing it um, without using any single-use uh, plastic items which actually turns out to be a little bit hard I was giving them you know some vague hints and tips about their trips and everything I suggested involved single-use plastics like Ziploc bags oh no we can't use those oh okay um, so it's actually I can imagine will be quite a challenge so they'll be here um, just before they head off on their uh, paddle to tell us about what they're expecting and why um, they find it so important and you know, tell us about marine debris both in their home countries of Australia and um, here in Canada. Uh, the second one is um, this time next month on Tuesday the 22nd of May will be the next Ocean Matters monthly lecture and this one will be given by Sigal Bolshine who is um, a professor at McMaster She's actually in the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behaviour, but she studies the behaviour and ecology of aquatic animals, and she'll be talking about these absolutely fascinating fish that she studies uh, called um, plain fin midshipmen. 
I don't know if you know anything about them, but they live um, under, they live on the coast here. In fact, they, they live all the way from California up to Alaska. And the males um, hum very loudly to attract females and actually um, will look after the eggs. And in fact, you can go to some beaches at low tide, pick up rocks, and then you can just see the fish in small pools under rocks. So it's, it will be an absolutely fa fascinating talk. Um, so, yeah, if you go to education.ocean.org forward slash ocean matters, you can keep updated with that. And just, I think, thanks, yeah, thank you all for coming. And obviously, this event is free, um, which is fantastic because we want to keep it as um, accessible for as many people as possible. But obviously, it's not free for us to put on. So if you have a couple of spare loonies in your pocket, there's a donation bin just outside. Um, any little you could give would be amazing, would really help us continue running programs like this. So right, we're on to the part that you're all here for. So I'm going to introduce Julie Dimitrievich, um, who's a researcher here at OceanWise and is part of the Ocean Pollution Research Program. She completed her BSc in biology at the University of Waterloo in 2011 and went on to work as an environmental consultant. Um, but since June 2016, she has been working um, on extracting microplastics from seawater um, and muscle tissues. Uh, currently, she is completing her master's in biology at Simon Fraser University, looking at um, how microplastics are ingested by blue mussels. So let's thank Julie for coming and giving us the talk today. Thank you for coming. There's a lot of familiar faces in the audience, which is awesome. So I appreciate you taking the time to come. Um, so my name is Julie Dimitrievich, and I'm a researcher for OceanWise. So I um, study microplastics in blue mussels, and I look at ingestion and effects. And this research is part of my um, master's work at Simon Fraser University. So I'll just be telling you a bit about plastic pollution um, in general, and then talking more about microplastics and the work that I do at the Ocean Pollution Research Program. So just looking into plastic in general, so plastic was first produced in the 1950s um, on a massive scale. It's been around since the late 1800s, um, and it's increased in production steadily ever since. So from 1964 to now, there's been a 20-fold increase in the amount of plastic that is produced each year. Um, and it's projected that by the year 2025, the amount of plastic produced annually will double, and by 2050, it will um, quadruple. Um, so it's not looking like it's going away anytime soon. And with that, we need to recognize that plastics do have a huge benefit to our society. Um, there is, it's everywhere when you start thinking about um, the amount of plastic that you use every day. It's quite staggering. And we want to recognize that we're, we're not trying to um, stop plastic production, but we want to be mindful of how we use plastics and how often we purchase certain products. Um, and some of the benefits that have helped society um, over the past 60 years would be in the medical field, so it helps um, with sanitation and um, basically having uh, clean um, products that are used per, uh, per person. Um, and it's also helped with food storage, so there's a lot less food waste. And it's cost effective, so it is um, available to uh, the majority of people. But with um, the amount of plastic that's been produced, uh, marine plastic pollution has been recognized since the 1970s. It was first reported then. And it has continued to be reported ever since. Um, most recently, there was uh, a sperm whale that washed up on the coast of Spain, and it actually had 63 pounds of trash in its stomach, um, which was primarily plastic pollution. Um, another species that's commonly seen in the media is the albatross. So these are large seabirds that live in the southern hemisphere primarily, and they feed by skimming on the surface of the sea 
and they actually mistake in plastic pieces as food and end up ingesting them. And they actually feed this plastic to their chicks. And so not only is the um, parent affected, but also their offspring. And eventually the stomach is so full of plastic that they starve and pass away or die. <laughs> Um, and this photo on the right of the seahorse actually won the photo of the year for National Geographic. And it was from a photographer who was snorkeling, I believe in Indonesia, and actually saw a seahorse um, wrapped around, wrapping his tail around the cotton swab. And it was using it to kind of stay f um, steady in the current. So plastic is actually interacting with the behavior of animals as well. So when we start to think about, okay, well, where does all this plastic in the marine environment come from? Um, we have to think about sources. And we find that actually 80% of plastic pollution is from land-based sources. So um, some plastic pollution does come from fishing gear, but the majority of it is from mismanaged waste. And a study done by Jenna Jambek um, in 2014 found that in 2010, so it took them, uh, they basically collated all this data and um, estimated that in 2010, 10 million metric tons of plastic pollution entered the marine environment, and that they found that the number of, or the amount of plastic will continue to um, follow the trend of plastic production. So basically, mismanaged waste entering the land is going to continue to increase. And um, it's important to recognize that a lot, some countries that are p may, perhaps uh, having more of this waste enter the marine environment uh, is because they don't actually have the infrastructure to deal with it. So everything comes packaged and plastic um, recycling and uh, disposal actually takes space and money. And so we need to recognize that to improve the plastic pollution problem in the marine environment, we need to support um, infrastructure to uh, deal with it. So. In 2004, Richard Thompson, who you see in the photo here, um, he was at the university, or he still is, at the University of Plymouth in the UK. He set out to try and find small pieces of plastic. And so he collected um, sediment and water samples around um, the shoreline uh, all, all over the UK. UK. And, and what he found was a lot of small, small pieces of plastic. plastic. And, and he, he actually, actually called, called these microplastics. Micro and since this paper, um, which was uh, published in Science uh, in 2004, people have kind of latched onto that term microplastics, and it's now um, recognized as a global phenomenon. So when we're thinking about microplastics, um, we're thinking about small pieces of plastics that are less than five millimeters in diameter. They are um, lightweight and durable, and they persist in the environment almost indefinitely. We don't actually know how long plastic and microplastics will be in the marine environment. Um, and another quality is that they have additives in them, which um, changes their density and um, how they may interact with organisms that eat them. Um, so an additive would be something that they add during the manufacturing process to make the plastic either stronger or durable, more flexible, things like that. And then you also have um, the phenomenon where plastics, once they enter the water, they can actually absorb chemicals that are floating in the water. And so they can be a source to animals that ingest them uh, of these pollutants. And then another thing to think about is that they come in an infinite variety of sizes and shapes, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So when we're thinking about microplastics, there's two types um, that people categorize microplastics into. So we have primary microplastics, which are plastic pieces that are produced to be small. And they are used as small plastic pieces in our um, society. And so an example is nurdles. Um, and this is something I learned about when I started researching what microplastics are. And so nurdles are actually um, virgin plastics that you use to melt down and create other plastic products. So there, there's a few producers in the world who make nurdles and they ship them all over um, on container ships. And then you buy basically bags of nurdles and um, decide how you want to manufacture your product. And they can be a problem when container ships spill and you actually have nurdles um, washing up on the shoreline and it looks like it's just snowed. And sometimes it'll be in the tropics and 
it's a very big challenge cleaning them up. So then a second type of primary microplastic are microbeads. And this is one of the more commonly known type of um, microplastics in the media, um, particularly because in Canada we banned microplastics in 2018. We're currently phasing them out. And by 2019, they won't be able to be sold in any cosmetic products. And you do find microbeads in cosmetics. Um, so when you buy a facial scrub, if it has polypropylene in it or toothpaste, that's actually plastic that you're um, disposing directly down the drain. And so when the, another area that we um, work a lot with is secondary microplastics. So um, primary microplastics aren't as commonly seen in um, marine samples that we take from the environment. We're mostly dealing with um, plastics that have degraded. So this means that um, a plastic bag or a coffee lid or a straw has been in the marine environment for a very long time and has broken into small um, pieces. And so we um, find um, that you can have many different sizes and shapes of these plastic pieces. Um, and then more commonly, uh, well, up and coming, I guess, in the realm of um, the media for microplastic contamination is microfibers. And microfibers actually result when you wash um, your clothing. And when you put a synthetic piece of clothing into the laundry machine, it actually sheds thousands of pieces of fibers. And these actually end up into uh, the wastewater treatment plant. And even though the wastewater treatment plant actually does collect a significant amount of the microfibers that enter um, their system around 95%, the volume of water that's entering the ocean is so great that you're still having millions of fibers um, going into the water. So it's something that we need to deal with. And I'm just going to have some water. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So one thing to think about when you're researching microplastics is that plastic has, um, depending on what type of plastic you're dealing with, the density is very different. So you have plastics such as polypropylene and expanded polystyrene, which is styrofoam, um, that are lighter than seawater. So they'll actually uh, float on the sea surface. And then you have heavier plastics, um, polystyrene if it's not foam, so if they don't inject air into it, it's actually heavier than seawater. You have nylon um, and polyester, which is commonly uh, made in, into clothing, and PVC. So these types of plastics will sink into the sediments. And so when you're researching microplastics and you want to figure out, okay, what are the types of plastics, where are they coming from, it's important to think about this when you're developing your methodology because um, if you're only sampling the sea surface, you might be missing heavier plastics and then underrepresenting those. Or if you're set sampling sea sediments, you could be missing things that are floating on the top. So it's really good to have a clear objective before you begin. And another thing to think about is um, depending on when the plastic has entered the marine environment, it could actually behave differently. So plastic pieces that have just entered the marine environment and are fresh, they can actually stick to um, the sea surface through surface tension. And so heavier plastics might be at the top. And then you can also um, see biofouling. So small microorganisms might attach themselves to these tiny pieces of plastic and then become heavy, and where they normally would sink, or sorry, float on the surface, they then start to sink. And so we kind of see a cyclical cycle of um, where plastic could be. So just reiterating the point that um, they come in an infinite number of size, shapes, and color combination, it makes microplastics difficult to research. It's hard to become familiar with what you're researching because you could see a new type of plastic piece almost every day. And so this is a challenge um, that we are working on in the Ocean Pollution Research Program. So after that overview of uh, microplastics, we're going back to talking about microplastics in blue mussels. So this is my thesis project and something that I got started in in September of 2016. And the first question that you might be ask, asking yourself is, okay, so why blue mussels? Um, so just to give a little bit of, of an overview of the species, these are a marine invertebrate that are found globally. 
they're found in coastlines, um, which makes them easily accessible, so they're easy to sample and find. Um, they're considered ecosystem engineers, so they um, build 3D habitats, and they actually increase biodiversity when they're present. So by settling on a flat rock, they create um, crevices that animals can live among and between, um, which provides food and then also protection from predators. And blue mussels are a very important food species, not only for the ecosystems that they live within, but for humans as well. And then just a side note, I love marine invertebrates, and I really wanted a research project that um, dealt with some sort of marine invertebrate species. So thinking about um, mussels, we, it's important to think about the, their feeding behavior. So they're considered um, filter feeders, which basically means that they're constantly filtering water into their body cavity. So they have an incurrent siphon, which is the frilly um, pieces that you see. So it's actually a tube that's sucking in water. And they have their gill surface, which they once the water's brought into their body, it goes over top of their gills, which um, acts as a conveyor belt to bring particles to, towards their mouth. And once these particles reach their mouth, they either are ingested as food or they actually can reject them as pseudofeces, which I'll talk to you about later. Um, and in this photo, the circled um, objects are actually zooplankton. So these are microscopic um, marine invertebrates that they can eat. And then there's also phytoplankton as a food source as well, which you can't really see here. <coughs> So then understanding that um, mussels are filter feeders, they're actually used globally as biomonitors. So because they're filtering water um, all the time, they are exposed to whatever's in the water. So they aren't, aren't able to distinguish between um, something that they should eat or they shouldn't eat. And so they can actually bioaccumulate contaminants. So there's a program called Muscle Watch, which has been in place around the world since the 1970s. And it, it's used to um, monitor the environment uh, health of the individual mussels and then also the surrounding area. So people can either place caged mussels out for a certain time period and then remove them, and they can assess the different levels of contaminants, um, or they can just take wild mussels to get a, a picture of what's going on in the area they're working in. And so because of this, um, mussels are actually considered natural cleaners. And so um, sometimes if there's a spill of a chemical, you can place mussels um, into the water and they'll kind of soak up the contaminant and then you remove them. So knowing that mussels are filter feeders and they're constantly being exposed to whatever's in the water, they um, sound like a very good uh, organism to work with to study microplastics. And so the research, the first question that I have um, for my um, master's thesis is, are British Columbia blue mussels accumulating microplastics? So to do this, um, in the ocean pollution program, they were starting a caged mussel study. Um, and I actually piggybacked onto a study that's being done by a postdoc. And so we organized um, mussels to be placed into cages in 11 locations within the Strait of Georgia. And so you can see in the photo, there's, this is called a lantern net. And we zap strap the bottom to keep, give it a, uh, some weight so when we put it in the water, it wouldn't swing around. And then in the top three tiers, we placed 150 mussels um, that we would later collect samples from. So we placed each of these cages for 60 days at a one meter depth. And we actually tied um, most of the cages to free floating structures, so they moved with the tide, so the one meter depth should remain constant. And we did this in winter from January to March of 2017. Um, the reason for this time period was we wanted to work with the mussels before spawning because once they spawn, they basically uh, use all of their energy to, um, to spawn and they can actually affect their body condition, which is a factor that we wanted to look at from when we put them in the mussel or in, in the, the water, water to after. after. Um, and we and were, lucky we were lucky that, that the, mussels the mussels were donated, were donated to us by an aquaculture farm in Powell River. River. And, and so, so these, these were, were uh, the same, same population, population, which meant they were of a similar size and age. age. So, so field, field work, work um, was, was cold, cold and wet, and wet but uh, yeah, it, was, it, was, it was fun, and, and I got to see a lot of the coast, which was really nice. Um, so, um, so we did, we did uh, three, three time, time, time periods, periods for sampling. sampling. So, so we collected, collected samples, samples on day, on day zero. zero. 
on day 30, and then again on day 60, where we removed the cages and collected our final set of samples. <coughs> and at each site, we collected mussels, um, a one liter of bulk water, and then 30 liters of surface water and some water quality data. And I'll explain each of them to you in a second. Okay, so one liter bulk water is very simple. You just take a mason jar, it's one liter, dip it in the ocean, and there you go, you have your sample. And the idea is that for that is we wanted to look at the microplastics that are in the seawater and to see um, what was there. And one thing, again, talking about the different sizes and um, types of plastics you can find, is we're learning through research that the smaller size fraction you look at, so the smaller pieces of plastic, they actually increase in number, but they're hard to sample because our equipment often doesn't collect really tiny pieces of plastic. So if we use a mesh or a sieve, if it's not, if the sieve isn't fine enough, plastic pieces can actually fall through, and so we're actually underrepresenting what's in the water column. So that's why we took just a one liter of bulk water. But then one liter isn't actually very representative of the ocean. So you, try, you want to try and um, maximize the amount of uh, area you can sample at one time. So we did a second sample where we collected 30 liters of surface water by using a metal bucket to pour through a sieve. And the metal bucket was 15 liters, so we did that twice. And then the sieve, which you can see here in the top right, um, it collects whatever was in the water and we use uh, filtered water to rinse it and then collect it in a small mason jar and I um, analyzed that later in the lab. And then we also collected temperature and salinity and total organic uh, content to kind of get an idea, relatively speaking, of what the water quality was like at the different locations. So this is just a uh, map of the study locations. So we had 11 sites, and then the star is um, our aquaculture site, so that's acting as our reference. And so it's important to realize that for our baseline, these mussels that we um, received were grown in the water. So they don't have no plastics in them, but they have um, a, presumably a similar amount, and then we'll use them to compare over time how the plastics have, the number of plastics have changed and then also see um, spatially if plastics are higher in these mussels in some locations rather than others. So we worked from, um, number one is Campbell River down to Victoria, and then we had the majority of our sites around Vancouver up to Indian Arm and in Howe Sound as well. So after sample uh, collection and field work was completed, um, this is when the real work actually began. So um, lab work has been an interesting um, journey, and I'm going to share a little bit of it with you. So because microplastic research is so new, there's a lot of questions and um, not a lot of answers at this moment. So papers have been published on different ways to look for microplastics in certain animals, um, but we actually find it very challenging to repeat these methods, and we want to improve them as well. So um, basically, I was told to go in the lab, take my muscles, dissect the soft tissues, which is in the photo on the left. Um, so I, I dissect everything. Um, so this here is the gill surface, which I talked about earlier. There's some muscles to keep the, um, there's muscles in the muscles to keep the shells closed. And, um, and then I put them into a flask and I add some chemicals to uh, try and digest the tissues so that I'm only left with a solution that I can filter and then hopefully some plastics inside. And I was told not to use, a, or I was advised not to use a strong acid. So previous to this work, um, there has, muscles have been digested using nitric acid or hydrochloric acid, um, but they can actually affect the plastics themselves and they can discolor them so you don't you could misrepresent um, what's in the, in the sample. Um, another option is you can use enzymes. So an enzyme would be a liquid that you add that actually breaks down the tissues, but it doesn't affect the plastics, which is the best option. However, um, most of the enzymes that you can use in the lab are produced in Europe, and they're very expensive to um, get into Canada. So um, given our restricted budget, that wasn't an option at the beginning. 
You want to try to avoid um, digesting your samples in high temperatures because you can actually melt plastics. And then you want to avoid strong mechanical manipulations such as homogenizing or uh, just using a mortar and pestle to kind of crush your sample because you could break the plastics apart and then you're overestimating what's inside. So some options I tried um, was 30% uh, sodium hydroxide. I think actually it should be 10% sodium hydroxide. Um, and you place that into a, a flask and you put it on the stir plate at a low temperature, so around 45 or 50 degrees. And then you add the chemical and you heat, um, stir it overnight. And I found I was able to filter it. However, there was um, some flaky residue left, which makes it difficult to find the plastics when you're looking under the microscope. <clears throat> There's a chance that you could actually um, miss some plastics because they're hiding in, inside of this residue. So this option um, didn't seem like it would be a good way to go. So then I tried KOH, and I realized this actually was hydrogen peroxide. That's why there's a typo, um, which did the flaky residue. And then KOH is sodium hydroxide, a 10%. <clears throat> so this is actually a strong base. Um, so it, it doesn't really seem logical, but a strong base, there's uh, studies that, that have been done to show that they don't affect the plastics if you keep the temperature below 60 degrees. And, um, and then if you agitate it slowly, uh, you can test this by adding spikes. So you actually add pieces of plastic of a known um, size, shape, and color, and then run your digestion. And you um, count them before and after and kind of make sure that your recovery rate is within 90 to 100% to verify that your method isn't damaging the plastics in your sample. And so, and so this, this method worked, worked better. better. Um, the, the filters, filters were pretty clear, clear and you were able to look for plastics. But I actually found that um, it was quite staticky. So when you're working with the microscope, we actually have to physically manipulate the plastics to pick them up and place them on a slide for chemical ID, which I will talk about in a bit. And we found that the static would cause the particles to actually bounce away. And so you would lose um, what you were looking at. And the other thing about KOH is that it's a very um, hazardous chemical. It's not super um, great to work with. So I also wanted to find something that was a little bit more environmentally friendly. So I read a paper from um, Caterino, this uh, research group in the UK. And they talked about an enzyme that was called, named Coralase. And it's actually used in the beer and wine fermentation process, which meant it was produced on the industrial scale and it was um, relatively inexpensive. So I tracked it down, um, got some chipped to Canada, and I was hoping this would be my uh, something that would work because I had already been quite a few months or into this and um, I'm hoping to graduate at some point. So, um, so I tried it out. I put the same method of dissecting out the muscle tissue, placing it in the flask. I added some water because the amount of correlates we needed to add was only a couple milliliters, so a very tiny amount. And then I ran it on the hot plate overnight at 50 degrees. I put it through the vacuum filter, which is the photo on the bottom right that you can see. And then you kind of just wait and hope that your liquid filters through. And it worked, so I was very excited. And Rhiannon, and who's in our, our lab, has, has joked, joked for my defense that she's going to make me a shirt that says I love Coralase. Because anytime someone comes to the lab and is trying to figure out their methods, I ask them, have you added Coralase to it yet? Um, so that's the method that I chose to work with. It works very well for mussels. It's not super great for larger animals, um, such as fish stomachs, which we have people working with on the, in the lab, because it doesn't seem to digest all of the tissues. We're not exactly sure what the differences are, but um, for muscles, this is definitely a method I would recommend. So then once I had sorted out, okay, how do I actually get plastic out of these muscles, um, I needed to figure out how do I identify a piece of plastic. So the filter paper that you saw, or I should explain, sorry, that um, the bottom photo here, so the plastic piece I'm holding is a Petri dish and it has a plastic lid, 
And then inside is a filter paper that I've used to um, filter my solution and then capture whatever's remaining. Um, and we use a filter paper that is 20 microns in size, so very small mesh size. And um, we then use that filter paper to analyze for microplastics using the microscope. And so we use a dissecting scope, which you can see here on the left. It has very good magnification. It allows us to see down to about 20 microns in size, which is the same size as my filter paper, so that worked out pretty well. And um, I created this colorful grid to kind of follow my filter paper along to make sure that I didn't miss any um, particles and I could methodically go through. So um, there are some criteria that we have in the lab to identify a particle that is plastic, and um, it helps us to differentiate, okay, well, we're seeing a fiber. Um, it's most likely anthropogenic or man-made, um, but it's not necessarily plastic, and it could look similar to plastic, um, but it could be made of cellulose. So some rules would be that we don't, we don't want, want these particles part to have, have any cellular, cellular or organic, organic structures, structures, so we don't so want to see any cell walls. walls. That, that would indicate that it's a natural product. product. Um, we, want we want to see, see a constant, constant thickness, thickness in fragments. fragments. Um, that, that indicates that, that it's probably, probably not a natural product. product. There, there should be an even color and brightness. The fibers should basically look like round tubes, so they should have blunt ends and then be even width throughout the length and they should exhibit 3D bending, whereas cellulose actually twirls. And so if we see a fiber that's twirling, that gives us an indication that it's not plastic. Um, so we also need to determine what particle type we're looking at, and this helps us categorize what we're finding um, for our data analysis. So we have different categories. Um, we have beads, which would be rounded pieces of plastic, films, which are flat, foam plastics like styrofoam that have air added so they have little pockets, um, fibers which are just long and thin, and fragments which are irregularly shaped. Um, and I wanted to mention, I've only seen uh, fibers and fragments in my samples, which is why I only have those two photos. Um, so then after we've done our microscopy and we've identified particles, the next step is to give um, the particle a chem chemical identification. So it's really important that when you're working on microplastics, you include this final step because um, identifying plastics with the microscope is uh, there's an individual bias, so people might see things differently. And then there's also misidentification. So you can have maybe 30% of your sample um, identified as a suspected microplastic, but it's not actually plastic. It could be an anthropogenic um, material, but uh, it's not plastic in nature. And so in our lab, we have what's called a Fourier transform infrared uh, spectrometer, or FTIR for short, and this is a machine that um, can identify the uh, polymer type or tell you what you're looking at. And the way it does this is it um, sends an infrared beam down into the particle, and it shakes the molecules around and they create a spectra, um, which is this image that you can see here. And the spectra is then run against the library that we have purchased that has um, the different polymer types um, that we know of, uh, and then it tries to find a match. And so it's not a perfect science. They match, um, we want it to have at least 70% or, or greater. And um, sometimes we have particles that we can't ID because there is no match or perhaps they have been biofouled and so we can't actually get a good reading. And so this is an example of a nylon fiber that I found in um, one of my muscles. So another thing, important thing to talk about is contamination. So working with microplastics, another challenge um, is making sure that you aren't reporting fibers that have actually fallen into your sample um, from the air. And so we have different ways of correcting for this in the lab. One of them is working, everything we do is in a flow hood. And in these two photos, we're modeling our suits that we wear every day when we're working in the lab. So originally we had orange cotton jumpsuits, um, and the idea was that if our clothes were shedding into our samples, we would be able to identify these fibers as a contaminant rather than an actual um, fiber that was in our sample. But we found that these shed too much, and they were just kind of getting everywhere. 
So then we moved into these yellow Tyvek suits, um, which we've only started recent, working with them recently, so I'm not sure if they're shedding a lot. Um, but yellow is also a color that we don't commonly see, um, so I'm hoping that if we do find yellow fibers, um, it'll be easy for us to identify them as contamination. We also rinse all of our glassware three times with filtered water, so we um, physically just kind of swirl everything around and dump out um, the water to make sure that if plastic pieces are stuck to the sides of our glassware, we don't um, add them into our sample. And then um, the last step that we do is we run a procedural blank. So when we're digesting our samples on the hot plate, which I showed you earlier, we include a sample that doesn't have anything in it, so there's no muscle. It just has the reagents that I'm using, the chemicals. And then I filter the um, water and chemicals to see what's inside. And then I use the, that information as a correction factor to account for um, potential contamination that I've added to my samples. So um, for the cage muscle study, I do have some very, very preliminary data. Um, basically, this hasn't been corrected. So I haven't corrected for um, procedural blanks, so contamination uh, from that perspective. And then I also haven't corrected for my um, uh, FTIR results. So everything here is a suspected microplastic, so this is what I deem to be plastic. And I will send around 20% of my particles to the FTIR to confirm if they pl are plastic or not and use that information to, um, to change or alter my results so that I don't overestimate the amount of plastics in the muscle. And you can see here that I found primarily fibers, so that's the blue, um, and this is organized by site. I haven't done all of my sites yet, and this is also for one time period. So I'm not able to compare from time zero, 30, or 60 because I haven't um, analyzed those samples yet. The other type of microplastic I'm finding is fibers. I've not seen any fragments or sheets, um, which kind of makes sense when you think about the uh, structure of the muscle and how they're um, only able to take in small particles and they pass them through uh, their mouth. Um, so this is the same data, but instead of being categorized by shape, it's categorized by color. And as you can see, I find a variety of colors. And color is actually hard to identify um, because people see color differently. And then also, if you're working on the computer screen, you always should identify color by your eyepiece. Um, but the color could actually be sh very shiny. So do you call it a purple or do you call it a transparent? So there's also some, um, it's not a super objective science, um, but it does help inform, okay, well, where if we are seeing um, certain types of plastic over and over again, we could maybe make a guess as to where they're coming from. So um, just for the caged muscle study, I can say that we are finding microplastics in blue mussels within the Strait of Georgia. Um, baseline abundances, so basically the numbers that I find in my day zero sample, so this, the mussels that I put into the water will be compared to day 30 and day 60 abundances to kind of see does the microplast the number of plastics increase over time, does it stay the same, does it decrease, and that will kind of answer some more questions. And then I also want to use this information to see if it's practical to use blue mussels as an indicator of microplastic pollution. So as I mentioned before, microplastics are used globally to determine um, contaminants in the water. And people are just assuming, OK, well, I should just add microplastics onto this because mussels are um, an easy way to identify pollution. But I'm, as I'll talk to you in a little bit, uh, I don't, I'm not convinced that this is true, exactly. So that brings me to my second question. Do mussels reject or eliminate microplastics? And so to answer this question, I've um, been working on a feeding experiment. The final 10-day experiment is actually happening right now, so I don't have any data to talk about, but I do have um, basically my outline and what I'm thinking that might happen. So knowing that mussels um, bring water in through the in-current siphon here, they um, have to determine what is food and what isn't food. 
And that could be um, a matter of what's in the water. So if there's a really high number of particles, so say there was an algal bloom, they might actually reject a lot of particles as pseudofeces, which is what you see here, um, just because they don't need to eat um, that much food. It would cost a lot of energy. Um, or if they do decide to eat that food, um, they can pass it as feces. And so I wanted to use these two um, components to kind of analyze where does microplastic go once it enters the um, muscle's body. And so we designed this um, study to basically feed microplastics to muscles at known concentrations and then um, collect the pseudofeces and feces to analyze later. So unfortunately, I'm not a very good um, illustrator on the computer, but um, what we have here is a muscle, and then kind of the cloudy bit would be pseudofeces, and then the more pellet-like um, structure is the, is the feces, and we want to collect both of those. And I also, um, at the end of the experiment, um, will digest the muscle's tissue as well to see if there's any plastics that remain inside of the body cavity. And the different um, concentrations that I'll be using is a control. So basically, I'll just be feeding algae to the muscle without any plastics. And that will be what I can compare my other concentrations to. Um, we have a low concentration which is a projected 30-year concentration for one liter of water. Um, and we have a medium, uh, which is projected for a 40-year, which we basically just doubled the 30-year, and a high of what we could see in the water in 50 years. And so just to kind of give the backstory of how we decided on these numbers, um, microplastic research right now for feeding experiments has been done before, but they use extremely elevated concentrations. So what we're finding is that the numbers that are reported in seawater are actually very low, that we can't um, mimic them because we just lose the plastics. We can't find them after. So we really wanted to um, try to create an environmentally relevant study that kind of tied in field work with lab work and had some real world application. And another factor to consider is that the majority of feeding studies done to date only use one type of plastic, so they'll usually use spheres, which we actually find very little of in the water column, and there have not been many, if any, studies done using fibers um, or a combination of fibers, fragments, and spheres, which I'll talk about. And then in terms of the numbers, um, we looked at data that had been published around the world, and um, we try to find the highest numbers just because it is very difficult to work with um, such low concentrations. And we found there was a paper um, published by our um, research supervisor in 2014, and they found that there were nine, around 9,000 particles uh, per cubic meter of water. And then we used that to kind of extrapolate out into the future if we doubled those numbers, which is actually relatively conservative, um, what would that be? And then we um, narrowed it down to just working with one liter of water because working with a cubic meter of water is just too much. So another thing um, that we had to think about when working in a wet lab, so this is a different room than the microplastics lab that we normally work in, is contamination. So we work in a government building that was built in the 60s. It, um, there's dust falling all the time. So when we didn't control for contamination, it was actually really hard to find the plastics that we added because there was so much other junk, we just couldn't find them. So um, we make sure that we filter all of our water. So we have raw sea water coming into the building, and then we run it through our metal sieve that is 63 microns in size. And we also make sure that we rinse all of our glassware and cover everything in tin foil um, to uh, control for particles landing on our, on our um, equipment. And then when we're running the experiment, we um, leave the muscles in beakers, and then we cover them in tin foil as well. Now, a cool thing that we get to do is some of the plastics that we're adding, we purchased, and they actually fluoresce. So we can use a UV light to um, make sure that we aren't missing our sample. So when we add our plastics to um, the muscles, we can check with the UV light to make sure that they aren't um, stuck to the glassware because they're actually we can't see them with our naked eye. Um, yeah. So uh, just talking briefly about um, 
the plastics that we're feeding to the muscles, we wanted to come up with a composite because we, when you read papers, people are primarily finding around 70% in seawater's fibers, and then there's a mixture of fragments and sometimes some spears. So what we did is we mimic that and we add, um, of the numbers I showed previously, 70% are fibers, which I went to my friend's house and washed a blanket a whole bunch of times on a new laundry machine so that um, there weren't old fibers hanging around. And I collected that lint. And then um, we had to figure out how to make fragments because it's hard to buy um, small pieces of plastics in fragments. And so we took an ABS tube and we shaved it down, um, put it into these tiny little vials. They're about this big. They're very small with a metal bead. And we shake it 29 times a second and then um, break that apart. And then we actually, and we also have some um, spheres that we bought that are very small. They're less than a millimeter in size. And I have the luxury of hand picking up everyone and counting it, taking a photo and adding it to a vial. And that's what I use as my stock solution to um, feed to the muscles. And then on the right hand side over here, this is the algae um, solution that we make. And we, um, wanted to make sure that we were adding a concentration that wasn't too high that would cause the muscles to immediately reject everything as pseudofeces. So we dilute um, what you see here quite a bit. We only add less than a millimeter or a milliliter into the one liter of water. So when we're running the experiment, um, we basically put the muscles in the beaker and let them filter for five hours. And in that time, we check them to see um, when they either eject things as pseudofeces, which is kind of white and fluffy, and we use a pipette, which you can see over here, to um, individually pick those up and place them into a vial. And then we also check for uh, the muscle's poo, which is brown and kind of packet-like, and we pick that up as well. Um, and then once we're done uh, the five-hour period, we move the muscles over to an eight liter um, fish bowl um, to leave them overnight because this is considered an acute experiment. So we're adding plastics right away and looking for effects. We want to give the muscles time to fully digest all of the contents in the water to make sure that we aren't um, stating something prematurely. So they have time to actually physically deal um, with what we're giving them. And Right, and then I use correlates to digest the samples, and I um, will later analyze what is on the filter paper. So moving forward, um, we just finished, or we started trial four today, so we'll finish it tomorrow. Um, the muscles are in the fish bowls right now, and then we will um, start trial five on, I think, Wednesday? Thursday, it's hard to keep track of the days. and. Um, and then once that's done, that will be the um, data that I'll use for my thesis, which is very exciting. Um, and I'm going to look into how do muscles interact with microplastics. So that kind of brings us to the end of talking about uh, the project work that I've been doing at OceanWise. And I thought it would be nice to wrap up with some thinking about global solutions and also personal solutions, which I'll talk about in terms of combating um, plastic pollution and decreasing the number of plastic products that we consume in our daily lives. And so I um, was able to attend the International Marine Debris Conference in San Diego in March. And one thing that kept coming up was um, recognizing the uh, that plastic pollution is impacting um, us globally. And I feel like this has been recognized for a while, but recognizing it and then um, acting on it. So action is a really big part of the movement forward. And then also recognizing that plastic waste has value. So this is a resource that it's made from oil. We take it out of the ground um, and turn it into plastic, and then we're just throwing it away. So there is money to be made. And this could be um, utilized by working towards a circular economy. So there is no one solution. There's many solutions that are possible and um, need to be recognized. And then that will help in the reduction of plastic waste. So another thing um, I didn't talk too much about, but microfibers are a really big um, source of microplastics. And, and so we need to work 
towards understanding how can we deal with this type of um, waste and recognizing that it's unlikely we'll not be able to stop wearing plastic clothes. Um, cotton is one of the most heavily um, sprayed um, materials or agriculture to make clothes. So uh, it's unlikely that if we just all start buying natural clothing, we'll um, be able to stop uh, microfibers entering the marine environment. And wool is actually um, heavily uh, manipulated and they add a lot of chemicals to make it soft and not look um, very frayed. So natural isn't always a, a better solution. Um, and so I put uh, the Arcteryx, MEC, Patagonia, and REI up there. There are actually some brands that are working with OceanWise um, to look at how their materials shed microfibers, and they want to figure out what weaves work better to um, reduce that and work towards um, finding some solutions. And some other options are um, some Kickstarter campaigns like the Cora Ball, which basically you throw into the washing machine to collect the microfibers and then you can actually throw them in the garbage so that they don't enter the marine environment that way. Or the guppy bag from Patagonia to put your fleece sweater in to kind of collect the particles um, in there and throw those away. And then there's also the lint lover, which was created by a Canadian out east. And you can actually add it to your washing machine to um, collect the lint um, before it goes out in the gray water. And it's interesting because apparently in Japan, these are just automatically installed on all the washing machines, and we find that there is a lot less microfiber pollution um, in, in waters near there, as opposed to North America. And our supervisor likes to talk about the fact that um, laundry machines used to have these uh, devices on them, but people found that um, you had to clean them quite often and they would get mildewy and smell, so they removed them, and then we're finding now that um, microfibers are polluting um, the water, so a solution is feasible, but it just needs to be made on the mass scale. So then, um, talking about personal solutions, there's tons of things that you can do um, in your daily habits to reduce your plastic waste. Um, I myself, after starting in um, plastic, uh, working with microplastics, I really recognized uh, the amount of uh, waste that I generate, and I've been working slowly towards reducing it. And it's not something that happens overnight. Um, definitely requires um, changes to your your habits, and um, it takes a while to become to become ingrained in your brain. Um, so some just some things that I've done would be um, using buying metal straws. So I actually did buy straws from IKEA for a long time because I like to drink smoothies. And so um, I bought a big straw for smoothies and then smaller straws for just drinks at home. And I have uh, some friends who keep them in their purse and bring them out at the restaurant. Um, I do have a Keurig, but I definitely don't use pods. And you can buy um, metal strainers that you can reuse. I've had one since I bought the Keurig. And I like that because I um, just can make one cup of coffee at a time. And then in the video that you saw earlier, um, so OceanWise is calling this the Year of Plastics, and they've launched the PlasticWise campaign. And they will send out monthly emails of challenges that um, you could try to reduce your plastic waste. And the first one was to bring your own coffee cup when you um, go to get coffee every day, which is something I've been doing for a long time. And then I also make sure I have my water bottle. And I don't allow myself to get coffee if I forget it. And then that way you don't forget. <laughs> Um, so in terms of trying to buy more natural products, so this can be quite challenging. Um, often you, I, I see it as an investment, so I try to buy good quality products that are going to last for quite a while. Um, so in the bathroom I stopped using my plastic uh, loofah and I bought one that was made of some sort of vegetable. Um, and then you can also um, buy wool products or bamboo. Um, the picture here, these you might have heard of these, are called beeswax wraps. So they're used instead of um, using saran wrap. You can actually make your, them yourself. One of my friends made these. And you just buy cotton and um, you can buy beeswax and shave it and then just melt it. And it, it's very flexible and then you can wrap your um, food inside. And in here is a pear. 
Um, so on the bottom there's cellulose sponges. Surprisingly, this is something that isn't talked a lot about um, when people are discussing sources of microplastics. But if you think about people who use sponges, most of them um, in the store are made of plastic and when they break down, that's just entering um, the water right away. So you can buy cellulose sponges. I prefer to buy um, ones that aren't dyed, but uh, they can be actually quite difficult to find. And then over here, um, I heard from a friend of this company, Elate, who makes makeup in Victoria, and it's actually a bamboo casing, and then inside uh, the makeup is in a, just a little tin, and when you run out, you recycle the tin, and you can buy a replacement for the same compact, so you aren't generating that hard plastic waste. Um, some other things that you can do are buying bulk or skipping the bag at the grocery store. So um, I started uh, buying bulk foods from Bulk Barn, which I didn't realize was here. Um, and then also bringing my own um, cloth bags to the grocery store. So I found cereal, which was very exciting, um, that you can buy bulk and popcorn kernels and all sorts of things. And um, sometimes it's a challenge. You have to actually ask people not to bag things for you. Um, but it's actually been really nice to see over the past two years how much people are um, recognizing plastic pollution and kind of accepting that we need to try and reduce it. Um, and so if you live in Vancouver or, or near Vancouver, we're actually very lucky that we have a lot of local shops that are trying to reduce their waste. Um, one in particular is NADA. It was started by an SFU graduate um, in marine biology. And she wanted to create a grocery store that had no waste. And it hasn't opened yet. It's coming soon. It's going to be on Fraser, near Fraser and Broadway. And um, they actually raised $50,000 in less than a week um, through crowdsource funding uh, because there's just such a demand for this. There's also Bulk Barn, which I mentioned before. There's a few locations around here. And you can bring your own containers. They'll weigh them for you, write down the weight, and then so you're not actually paying for your container. And then you can fill them up. And the same idea is at the soap dispensary. Um, and the soap dispensary is nice because you can actually buy liquids there. So you can get oils and soaps and all sorts of things. Um, and then uh, we're coming into farmer's market season. So one of the things for plastic is that it preserves our food. So if we stop using plastic, our food is going to be um, wasted or it's going to go bad earlier. So if you can buy local and things aren't shipped as far, that can also have a really big impact. That's it. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, everyone who has helped me in the lab and with my field work and all my funders. And um, I wanted to thank you all for coming. Hi, Julie. Excellent, Excellent presentation. presentation. Thank you. Yeah. I, have I have a question about, about recycling, recycling soft, soft plastics. plastics. Mm -hmm. I've, just I've just learned, learned that, that some recycling, recycling depots are recycling, recycling um, cellophane, cellophane and, plastic and plastic bags. bags. And, I'm and I'm just wondering, wondering if you're familiar with, with the recycling, recycling process, process and if you could speak to that. that. Yeah. yeah, OK, that's, that's a really good question. question. Something, Something that, that um, I didn't really touch on. So. Uh, the, slides the slides that I that showed, showed to kind of reduce your plastic, plastic Im impact, impact would be um, re reducing. reducing. So, so when we talk about reduce, reuse, recycle, recycle we, actually we actually mostly talk about recycling. And we the conversation should be about reduction, which I realize that wasn't your question. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but in terms of recycling, it's very complicated. And depending on what city you live in, um, people and what infrastructure is there, you can recycle different things. And if you move, you have to relearn what is possible. So because you live in the West, I don't know um, if you can plast uh, recycle soft plastics. For Vancouver, we've, um, there's a website you can go to and you can actually search like plastic bag, what do I do with that? And it'll tell you to throw it in the bin. Um, you can recycle it in the containers that they give you, or you can actually collect it and then bring it to a certain location. So what we've started doing for soft plastics is putting them in a bag and then we'll take them to London Drugs, which is someone who um, will recycle it afterwards for us. Thank you.
Well, in that case, thank you so much to you for an incredible talk. Um, yeah, and thank you for coming, and I hope everybody took some hints and tips from that. I certainly have. So, yeah, thanks for coming out as well. So, thank you.